Okay, um, should we make a start? Um, so, Chris, welcome to the May Tumblr School Grow Social Capital. My name is Russell Todd. Um, Matt's on a sort of like an inset day from Tumblr School in terms of hosting this. Is that is that how this works? Um, so, it's my first time in the uh, Inquisitor's hot seat. Uh, we are recording, so if you want to knock your camera off at all, then please feel free to do so. Um, pop any questions in the chat. Uh, links, observations, share any wisdoms, that sort of thing, please do. Um, we'll be talking for 20, 25 minutes with Julie Lee, um, and there's opportunity then for a little bit of Q&A afterwards. Matt, I think you're going to keep an eye on the chat, uh, maybe Theodore as well. Uh, shout out to Theodore, who is our student intern from, well, having graduated from Swans University, but the arrangement is with Swans University, and has another month, I think, Theodore. And is going to be the first person to set some roots for rugby league in in Bulgaria, or at least in Sofia in Bulgaria anyway. Um, so uh, before we uh, sort of crack on with Julia, just a um, little move through a couple of slides here. Uh, there we go. So Growth Social Capital set up during, during lockdown. Uh, Andy, myself, Sarah and Matt, with our sort of specific kind of backgrounds and disciplines and dare I say specialisms. And I suppose grow social capital in terms of what we want to do by way of sort of a mission and what we want to see happen in society, happen in communities is kind of where, it, where, where these all sort of interface and they all kind of coalesce. Um, so it's around trying to address sort of changing levels of social capital in communities, things around distrust, um, isolation, um, and trying to tap into that sense that uh, we heard this in Swansea with some of the disturbances around people taking more individual responsibility. We would argue that people need to take a bit more of a collective responsibility as well and to be responsible to forms of, of collective identity and community as well and to and not uh, create a sense of, uh, of just a group of individuals all going about their, their business. Um, so Tumblr, um, we explain this at the start of each one, or Matt usually has anyway, um, is a Yiddish word. And um, two, two Tumblr schools ago, so that would have been March, um, we heard from Alex Hillman out in Philadelphia. Um, and we were able to, we were really humbled and, and honoured to be able to speak to him because um, we, uh, like a magpie, we sort of stole that term off him and appropriated it for our own ends in the sense that we wanted to set up this school as a way of maybe bringing people together who have been at the forefront and at the vanguard of, of change. However, that is defined by, by individuals in whichever sort of sector and, and situation they find themselves in. And, uh, and Alex had talked about Tumblr as a Yiddish word, uh, as the, those people who get the party started, someone who is possibly even employed, paid to get a party started in those sorts of communities and cultures. And um, we, he, he uh, equated that to people getting things done or getting things started at the very least. Um, in, um, in in different forms of community, again, however so so defined. Um, and so we spoke to him uh, in March. We launched this in February with Sophie Howe, the Wellbeing um, and Future Generations Commissioner for Wales. Uh, I still think it's about the only role of its kind in the whole of the world, although I think uh, John Bird, the founder of Big Issue, is trying to push something through for, for, for England through through Parliament and the House of Lords, etc. Um, and then, as I said, then Alex. And then last month in April, we heard from Peter Davis, who I suppose was a predecessor of Sophie's in, in, in one sense, but he chaired a uh, future uh, uh, sustainability commission for, for Wales and was involved in it at a UK level as well. And again, at the vanguard of, of, of culture change around, around climate change and sustainability. And they're all available on our website uh, and on our YouTube channel. Um, so Julia, enough about all of those people. Um, we're gonna speak to yourself. Um, and uh, you and I, recorded a podcast because because you and I've got to know one another in the last 12 18 months through an organization called Sporting Heritage who are a wonderful organization who again do what they say on the tin I suppose um we uh, work on a, a sort of freelance basis on a range of different projects and I did a podcast with you back before Christmas where we talked about rugby league and your career in rugby league and I hadn't necessarily planned on using the word pioneer and it sort of popped into my head and then it kind of sort of popped out and um, uh, and I don't like to overly script those podcasts, as you know, but uh, it sort of came out and I thought, I don't know, is that, is that a bit much or, or, or is she going to like that label or, or what? 
Um, so before we kind of get into some of that, what do people need to know about you? Um, well, basically, I'm a Yorkshire lass, Yorkshire born and bred from Hull for a starter. Very proud. Uh, used to be um, cultured uh, in 2017, but that that's no longer, apparently. Um, and I'm passionate about sports, uh, making a difference in communities, um, but also passion knowing that whatever makes you tick, um, whatever you excites you can really make a difference. So I'm really passionate about mental health, well-being, and the, the, the role that sport and the arts can play with that. Um, and my, one, my passion is rugby league and that saved me. So I guess um, that's where I am from things is that, you know, if you can find what makes you tick uh, and, and that can really make a difference, uh, that's what's really important. So I spent 20 years working in rugby league in 20, well, 15 years as a rugby league referee, but also uh, I was the first female rugby league referee to referee uh, men's rugby league in the UK and Australia. Didn't realise it at the time. Um, and then I spent 20 years eventually being a director at the Rugby Football League. And it was just an honour because I was then all my passions and, and beliefs around uh, rugby league in particular could make a difference to so many communities throughout, throughout the UK. And at that time, we were the governing body for for the whole of the UK. Uh, it's not so much so now. Um, so big believer in making positive difference, really. So this is perfect for me, because uh, when I read what you were all about and you introduced it to, to me, Russ, it was just like, uh, you know, everything I deliver is around making that social change and having an impact, lasting impact. Im impact. Uh, and one of the reasons I left Rugby League uh, to set up Common Sense Initiative was around, I got a bit frustrated that it was all around money um, and then when the money went the great work you were doing was just stopped uh, and all those people that you went in and was doing some great stuff with it just stopped so everything that we do at CSI has you know sustainability and is built upon because of that very reason so and that's something that resonates with me in terms of community work um, as soon as the funding stops or is pulled um, on rare occasions, things can sustain themselves, and that's kind of the whole point of that sort of work and those sort of forms of intervention, I suppose, is to try to build that sustainability. And but all too often, things begin to unravel the moment that the the money is uh, the money is pulled. So this this word pioneer, as I said, I I wasn't sure when I when I used it in that podcast how how uh, how you feel about that or um, how appropriate that was. But to, in in some respects, it kind of conjures images of, of sort of discovery or intrepid exploration or something like that breaking new ground um and you just allude well, mentioned one alluded you mentioned how you're the first female referee in rugby league and i we were having a bit of a chat before we started around um some of the clubs up in the north of england i suppose it's fair to say that there's there's a certain machismo element to that sport so there's a certain machismo element to a lot of male sport but rugby league as we've discussed in the podcast and i'll drop a link into the chat you know it's a sport that's born out of defiance has quite an anti-authoritarian element to it, I suppose, in some respects. Certainly a, a class element to it in terms of its relationship with, with, with rugby union um, and maybe other sports as well. Um, so progressive in that regard, but, but, but you're the first female rugby, re rugby referee and didn't find things necessarily as, as progressive as, 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 they, as they could have been, I suppose. No, and interestingly, because I'm doing a lot with Sporting Heritage, that there actually weren't any females before 86 that even had tried officiating that we can find as yet uh, in all our historical content. And yeah, it's interesting that, well, it's rooted in its community, but that's very white male working class communities um, with when the communities came through Windrush, then black players and then Asian players began to uh, become part of the sport, which were embraced but not without, and you'll have seen some, um, you know, newspaper articles and coverage, you know, it's never been easy coming into a spot, whoever you are, if you're diverse um, and, and a bit unusual. And that's what was what it was the case, but I didn't see it as being abnormal to me. And, and the word pioneer is really interesting because at the time I just thought, well, I'm just doing what I love. So why can't I? And there was a bit of in the eighties, second wave of feminism. You don't talk about feminism. Uh, stuff that was going on um, and it was just about me saying well you keep, won't let me play you won't let me um, you know at first my uncle wouldn't let me go along to games because of all the swearing and, and all the other stuff that was around that and it wasn't a place for girls well I'm going to have a, a go at this refereeing lark 
um, just so that I can get to know a bit more about it. And at the time, I, I would like to say I didn't think it, it was Pioneer, which I didn't, but I knew it was different. I knew it was different by the way that they were towards me and the opening <laughs> of the clubhouse, which they it was working men clubs then. Mm -hmm. So that's where they had the meetings, the referees meetings. So suddenly they had to let a woman in because I was actually, you know, a member of that society. So there was all those things sort of going in the background that were the social stuff that was going on. And then the battle within rugby league that was a sport that does lead the way with a lot of things. But actually, you know, this was really unfamiliar to them and they didn't know what to do with it. And that's nobody's fault. It was just new and it was pioneering and they needed to get the head around it. And uh, still to this day, we have problems around women match officials, which in fact, uh, I'm part of the Women and Girls Advisory Group. We've just had a really great international conversation around a match official pathway, not a women's and a men's pathway, a match official pathway. So the women can come through it um, and uh, be a match official at whatever level they have. But if you think this was 1986 and I'm still having those conversations in 2021, it's taking a bit of time. <laughs> I was about, I, I, if anybody's looking back, watch, watches the recording of this and sees me glaze over, I'm doing the maths, trying to work out 86 to 21. That's 35 years, isn't it? And Yeah, yeah. And the conversations that I'm having is that, do you know, when I was refereeing, I was never given the opportunity to do finals or get the experience of the big games, apart from if there were women's games. And then, oh, off she goes. She can go do the women's finals and things. And unfortunately, there's still a psyche around that. But I'm really uh, encouraged, one, by the Rugby League World Cup and the parity within that of the women and the men and the women that are getting paid the same. Everything is, is on the same level. And the conversations I'm having internationally which is I'm having these conversations, talking to them about it, and they're going, right, how are we going to solve this now? Because it's right at grassroots that there's still those images that, you know, women shouldn't be part of the sport in certain levels and certain psyches because it is an it is an unconscious bias. I hate to use that, but it is an unconscious bias that it's just not the norm. We don't see enough female match officials, coaches, players in order for it to become the norm. Uh, and once it does, then it'll just take over. So it's, a, and it, it's an exciting time, I think, for not just rugby league, but women's sport, because we've seen such a huge change in the last five years. It's coincidentally, in some respects, you talk about bias. Uh, literally, only about half an hour ago, hour ago, I, I retweeted a tweet from Alex out in Philadelphia. We recommended a book that is on that very, very topic. And if I remember, I think it's in the Tumblr School conversation. It might be something else we, we did with him, but the it, it, it talk about some of the those assumptions then that are in place around from his perspective around work and co-working and trying to set up spaces for people to work productively but also fairly and and with um you know with more than just a, 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 a sort of like a paper reference or in some sort of terms of terms and conditions to use of the spaces to equality um and I, mark mark's got the phrase i'm going to pinch it off in sort of in terms of co-working so mark's been involved in Sometimes these places can be full of, sort of what he calls tech testosterone, where a lot of people kind of in mm. kind of digital innovation and that kind of stuff. And, it, and again, it's it's a, it's a it's a form of a form of machismo. And you know, we we can we can probably go off on a different tangent if we're not careful and talk about what that says about more about men and society, and everything else. But but you, you've talked about not going to games as a as a as a as a young girl with your uncle um, uh, or him not wanting. I know he went to games, but him perhaps not being overly in favour of that to now that, that 35 year, a bit longer than that, I suppose, timeline. Going back, you said, there you go, that's, that's, the, that's the book um, in, the, in the chat. In, in terms of you pushing some of those boundaries and some of those are very overt changes. So lots of men do it. Now suddenly we've got a woman doing this refereeing. We have our meetings in working men's halls and in the stutes where women don't tend to be made particularly welcome. Um, when suddenly now we've got to accommodate someone and so on. So there's a very overt thing happening there. But to what extent did you did you feel, so you're blazing a trail, but did you feel a bit lonely and a bit exposed at that? Because that's been something that other tumblers have spoken, uh, other speakers have spoken about in tumbler school, is that, that sense of, well, you've got to keep chipping away, but it's, I look around and there's not, sometimes not many other people <laughs> behind me or, or alongside me trying to, trying to bring about the changes. So you were obviously facing some overt discrimination at the end of the day, since people kind of obviously wanted to push back. But was there anyone else kind of with you in that in that 
in that journey at that point? Um, not in the officiating ranks, although having said that, what I did was I set up a women's referees association <laughs> so that I could get other women around to, you know, to go through because, the, and, and at the time, um, I, I just wanted to pay the, and other women were beginning to come up and we were all very supportive. So groups of women together being very supportive of each other. Uh, and moving on, set the at the time there was uh, Fred Lindop, who was the controller of referees at the time. Um, you know, there was no barriers to that apart from the amount of uh, physical fitness I had to do. And at the time, you know, there's all sorts of things around uh, what the fitness tests were like and whether they were appropriate for me and, and various other people. Um, but that that never, you know, they always al- allowed, you know, me to sort of take place in that. Uh, and then when Greg McCullum came and I, you know, I broached ideas about, you know, women's at that time, it was very popular about women coming together and empowering each other. And we set up the Women's Association, Referees Association. That was brilliant. It was a great time. Um, although in hindsight, although it was good then, I don't know if it's particularly helpful in the refereeing perspective, because as I've gone, as I've already said, it's about being a match official, not being male or female. It's about being a match official, and that's what we've got to promote. Um, and we, and it was a, it was a great time for having that support network around me because it was very lonely, and it was quite lonely throughout my career in rugby league, if I'm really, really honest, um, because everything I did seemed to be a pioneering thing and an effort and a battle. Um, mm. And one of the reasons I did leave the, the uh, Rugby Football League, apart from wanting to make positive difference, was I was a bit tired of everything, you know, becoming hard work. Um, and I needed to do it a bit differently. And I needed to be able to do it in my own time and place and not being kept said, oh, that's too hard or no. And, um, and I needed other people to take on the mantle as well. Yeah. So... Um, you know, the people to, to lead that charge because people weren't getting what I was saying, really, um, and not fully understanding. And I think at this last five years, and there's been a great piece of research, um, which I'll probably share with you, you can put in, it was done in Europe in 2000 about the true barriers around female participation in sport. It's a great piece of it's Erasmus bid, which is around governance structures and resources and physical not physical barriers but actually the way systems are set up that actually prevent women um progressing and i think that's a real step in the right direction because you begin to dig deeper than let's just get more women referees Mm -hmm. let's actually challenge what the and i'm using it quite a lot in in chairing the women and girls advisory group around right okay congress has 52 men every year um what are the barriers why are the women not coming through you know why have we not got women from around the world globally coming along to congress every year and and the same with the match official pathway why are the women you know not being nominated to go on the talent pathway what's happening underneath that that's preventing them so i think it's a really exciting time but as regards the loneliness yet very lonely and also lots of self-doubt worry lacking in confidence being told you weren't good enough uh, for over 25 years um and that you were different uh, can be quite uh, demoralising and and affect your mental health and well-being. To be honest, um, I suppose as a referee, it's a it's a given that nobody thinks you're any good anyway. When you no, when you're, that was when fine. That was that was a yeah of a Saturday afternoon or or, or of an evening or whatever. But um, but for it to be lonely, so, so I guess that eighty minutes, you 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 know, you're expecting that. You kind of brace yourself for that. You get used to it. But if it's lonely outside of it as well, and it's interesting you said that you. are Eventually, got tired and, and, and self doubt. I mean, these are these are well. I, I think a healthy way. He's not calling these negative things. I think that's the whole point. This is whole part of of the the the, the process of, of change and, and pioneering that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, and these post yeah yeah absolutely imposter syndrome in the in yeah. in the chat. But it, it, it's okay to say. Well, uh, I think you think use the phrase you know to, to hand the mantle on to say actually that's my time done. Somebody else has now got to step up, and I think that's. It's not always neat. It's not always tidy. It's not always able to be properly sort of succession planned and and and, and so on. Because from the outside looking in, people can, like you say, use the word pioneer and so on. There's almost like a heroism about it. It's it's heroic change. It's heroic leadership. Leaders. There's probably a, a, an overlap here with, with with leadership as well. But it can be it, well as you as you as you said, it can be hard. It can be exhausting, um, and, and and quite lonely. 
Yeah, actually. And yeah, I mean, the imposter syndrome is really interesting because I constantly did think I was in, I was never good enough. And then when I look back and actually it was a group of three women that took me on my journey. Um, one, a playwright, uh, Dr. Sarah Jane Dickinson, who met me um, about six years ago and went, I want to write a play about you. Uh, you are awesome. You are amazing. Um, and then two women from Space Two, uh, a, a social impact change charity uh, based in Leeds, who they wrote a play called Ref, and then they promoted my story and what I'd done in rugby league. And suddenly I began to believe, because actually before that, and I think a lot of women, and, and not just women, to be honest, men that have similar um, sort of feelings that I'd not achieved when she was saying she wanted to write the play. I went, you're bonkers, you're nutty, you. what's special about my story? But now doing sporting heritage and looking at other, because I'm particularly really interested in, in, in the hidden histories of women in sport. Women have a similar sort of back because they keep being told they're not. And you know, mm. I kept, you know, kept being told my story wasn't unique. My story, you know, you, you just sort of, you're in, you're, you are in the trenches, you know, you're in the trenches and you're surviving. Um, I did have a really good boss for about 10 years who, when I wasn't surviving, he, he you know, he, he sorted out a business coach for me and, and helped empower me um, to be able to, be, but then when I went back into the trenches, it was the same old story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I still had the same things happening. Um, and I guess there's, it wasn't until those group of women said, your story is brilliant, you know, that I started believing and then do public speaking. And now the whole thing around common sense initiative and the work I do, and it's globally now, is around, I've had my time, you know, I've had my time and I really succeeded as a referee, as a leader within sport and rugby league. I want to give the skills to other people and give them the confidence um, to be able to be great leaders of the future and also stand up for them. So me standing up for those women match officials is really important to me mm -hmm. because they don't have a voice. I never had a voice because, oh, you just want to get on. Whereas I can say, no, that's not right. So that the next generations, and I think the under twenties are really ballsy and they're ready for taking this on. Um, uh, and I also, I, I'm very honest with people, you do not have to put up with what I put, off, put mm -hmm. up with. And some women do still. But no, mm -hmm. we, I've done that. Being there, seeing it, done it, it makes my journey as, a, you know, as if, you know, that you don't need to put up with that. It's not acceptable anymore. Um, so that current crop then, that current generation of, of match officials or, or anyone else, in, you, know, you, you do coaching and stuff outside of sport as well, of course. I'm sure if, if they were in the in the hot seat now, being 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 questioned by me, they'd sort of say, uh, or Julie Lee's been one of my one of my inspirations. But who was your inspiration at the time when you were on that that journey? Uh, really interesting. I had a real mixture when when I was sent this. So Nelson Mandela was my all time favorite he hero as a leader. Just the way he led around his forgiveness was really, and I needed a lot of forgiveness throughout my career. You know, the way he could empathize with people and forgiveness. So of a, uh, someone's of a big standing, that was amazing. And then I had in sport um, two really interesting women. One was a woman called Sue Campbell, who at the time um, she was UK sport CEO chair, I think. And also Youth Sport Trust, who the power, she just plowed the power of sport into schools at the time, which unfortunately isn't any longer, but she did an amazing job putting sport on the curriculum and making it important for young people. And then a woman called Margaret Talbot, who unfortunately is no longer with us, who, when I was at Leeds Carnegie, she uh, was one of the first women um, who was um, director of a university. And at that time it was Leeds Metropolitan. Um, and I remember her fighting so many battles for us because when I was um, trying to, because at the time, Great Britain women uh, rugby league team weren't recognised as an international team and we need somewhere to train and play and, and we had no money. And she opened up the university basically for these women to train, but also she pioneered again sport on the um, educational agenda uh, through academia, right from school all the way up. Uh, and she was a really, you know, passionate and, and, and interesting but also believed because I think there's something around those two women that yes they reached la heights but they never forgot where they came from and they always made sure that you know people in it, that sport was you know equality for all really and that everybody could access it which is what they were about. So you leads nicely into the next question 
one of the things I said in the introduction was around you know trying to tackle this growing distrust and and and, and a sense of isolation and frustration that people have. We're not going to change change that ourselves, clearly. But there is a sense. Uh, I know Andy's kind of written a lot about this around how society feels increasingly polarized. Social media doesn't perhaps help. It's great for connecting, but we end up in echo chambers and certain kind of polarized camps and things. So, to what extent do you think sport, sporting heritage, maybe given what we what else we do as well, can be a force for good then in bringing people together and creating some of that positive discourse and and and, and change? Uh, well, I mean, just my role in when I was a director at the RFL and the power that rugby league in particular does around bringing communities together because they have that belonging that sense whether you're a spectator as a, as a young girl a 12 year old on the terraces I found myself you know I found a sense of belonging and still to uh, support the same team unfortunately that's never very good on the field but I belong there I, and I needed that sense of belonging I didn't belong anywhere as a child but the terraces helped me so there's there's one thing about being a fan and a sport but then there's about being part of a team and being part of something in your local community that's really important and sport can do it. Um, everything I run has an end goal around doing something in the community and usually around sport um, and how it, because sport is just such, a, it, 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 it cuts through everything because if you're good at sport, you don't necessarily need to be good at it, but you can get one, the physical endorphins and everything that sport brings, but all the skills around teamwork and working together and that social interaction. And there's so many studies being done around the power of that into the communities. Mm -hmm. And if just back to Nelson Mandela and the great rugby league world cup, um, you know, in South Africa and how it brought a country, brought a country together, um, you know, is, is the power of sport. And in fact, I'm just engaging in the Caribbean, which is really exciting around um, the disasters that's been happening there and how we can use sport again to bring those communities at a local level together. Because, you know, it's obviously not just the pandemic, but the volcano that's been going on there mm -hmm. um, has devastated communities. Um, my belief in sport and the arts, to be honest, because the arts is just great at this as well is just great for communities and community engagement. I mean, one of the reasons I live where I live is because the communities engage with you. You go down the street, they smile at you, they say hello. Um, you know, there's a real community. As soon as the pandemic came in, there was a WhatsApp group and we're all shopping for each other and doing the, you know, helping people that needed help. And to me, that that's what communities are about. And that's what I was brought up with and what I want to, young people in particular, to be able to see the value of that because they are particularly young people are socially isolated now in the bedrooms thinking that their mates are on social media and on on the games and actually they're not necessarily quality relationships mm -hmm. so what does this term social capital mean to you then well i think it's that belonging that togetherness mm -hmm. um it's that about we're all in this together and i think uh, you know i've mentioned why i've moved here but you know on the terraces that's where I belonged in where I was as a young girl. We had, I used to do the shopping down the street and look after a woman's dog and, and all those sort of things, right from being 11, 12 year old. Um, and I was a girl guide, you know, and that I felt a belonging there as a girl guide. And I later on became a guide leader. Um, and I think it's, it's about that belonging and that together and being there for each other uh, through thick and thin, really. Um, and that's why all my projects that I run part of Common Sense Initiative, as I've said, is really important to me. They do a project linked to that. And so adding there's there's something around mental health and well-being, which is is something I do as part of um, that I'm delivering around that help us high uh, about helping other people and making that difference. Um, and I just think, you know, it's a really important thing to do. Uh, and to know and to get that feeling of help as high as well. But although I sometimes used to go over and do too much helping uh, and forget about myself, but it, you know, it's, it's a great mm -hmm. thing to be in that community. And, and I miss that. I live down South and I missed those communities uh, because Yorkshire uh, does have a real sense of community and people and togetherness. Uh, and when I lived in London, I was very, very lonely because there wasn't that. Well, I know Mark has lived in, in the North and, and in London, so we have something to, to say to echo that. And I know Andy spent time in Yorkshire as well. Um, so tell us a bit more then about the Common Sense Initiative. I think it's fascinating. I hadn't quite picked up, I knew sport was an element of what you did. I hadn't quite picked up the, the sense to which 
you try to bring so many of it, so many of the work, so much of the work you do back to that, or not back to it, but to incorporate that that element in 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 all of it um, to quite to quite the extent that you do. Um, so you're encouraging people to presumably tackle things and to change things for what they perceive to be the better as 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 part of that and that might be in in all sorts of different fields presumably yeah it is and I did start initially um working sort of around young people in schools but back to my uh, one of my values around sustainability it couldn't be sustained so I felt as though I was an intervention and I don't want to be an intervention common sense initiative doesn't want to be an intervention it wants to be a lasting legacy so we I'm working um with another woman actually who was one of the first female football referees and this sport so that's one element of it where we take the power of sport and run run leadership courses so we're doing something with world athletics at the moment uh, which is a leadership program because you wouldn't believe a sport like athletics that's so split 50 50 gender doesn't have many women leaders and Seb Co identified that uh, and he's brought us in to bring a leadership program, but it's about those women then giving back into the countries they've come from. So training up the women as leaders, but also then as tutors to then deliver into their communities. So it's a brilliant initiative, which I'm going to repeat in rugby league because uh, it's worked so well. And around them having advocates, helping and supporting them, um, because it's about giving the women this, uh, in this circumstance, giving the women, women the skills, the confidence, but also the network. So we've got a WhatsApp group, we've got a Facebook group where we support each other as they're going. And also there's advocates back where they are and mentors that are part and parcel of the programme. And that's really important to me, that legacy. Um, and then on my, the other side is my NLP, uh, which is Neuro Linguistic Programme, a hypnotherapy side, where I can really work one-to-one with people with, um, mental health and well, you know, mental health and well-being, you know, PTSD, depression, those sort of things, which um, I'd love to do a lot more of, um, and it's what I want to build in my business because that that impact I can have on someone's life probably, and you know, they haven't been out the house for two years, and after two or three sessions with me, they're engaging with people or outside of the house, and that just, you know, is just a really, it's a gift. It's mm. a gift to be able to give someone. Um, and it's something, the NLP element, the neuro-linguistic programming, which I'd like to go more into schools, which is managing the bumps in the road. So giving you the resilience with your thinking, feeling and your behaving um, so that you can manage anything in life. So it's not a good business model because I never want them to come back to me again <laughs> with all the tools and techniques. I'll never be a rich woman. Um but the whole aim is to give them the skills and the resources to be able to manage life as it goes through. And it's a, it's a, it's a great place to be. So. Well, again, there's a parallel community where we often say, we, yeah, we, your aim is to do yourself out of a job. Um, one of the recurring themes that I listen to you now is that uh, as much as maybe trying to bring about change in some environment or institutional, some sort of sector arrangement or sector to keep focused on that and forever sort of looking ahead and trying to think okay what's the next strategy and what's the next target or the next goal a, 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 a recurring theme here is that don't forget where you've come from keep keep looking back over your shoulder because there's other people kind of maybe in your you know following along in, in your wake as it were or um, don't forget, I think you, you you referred to the woman at the, the university, I forget, was it Margaret somebody? Margaret Talbot. Um, yeah. yeah, don't forget, you know, never forget where she came from. Now, whether that's in an institutional sense or an organisational or whether that's in terms of maybe geography and location, that sense of actually, don't forget that. And it is actually good to put stuff, put something back in. It's So for every, I suppose the point I'm trying to make is as focused as you are going forward and, 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 and having a career path and going ever higher in that, uh, it does seem to be an important element with you is to is is to keep looking back and not forgetting what's what's come before. Oh, absolutely, and that and that's really key. I mean, I'm a trustee at Hull KR for that very reason. So you know, um, that rugby team that saved me as a 12 year old girl and gave me um, the the golden thread through my life of rugby league. You know, I'm a trustee because they do go and do great things in the community and giving my time for that. Um, so that giving back and going back and my roots of Hull are really key and important to me because um, although up until five years ago, I didn't think I'd really achieved, you know, if I can inspire those, those, those people from Hull or 
anyone, but actually particularly from, you know, from where I came from, that would just, you know, I, I actually, and I never won, unfortunately, but I was put up for three young girls nominated me to have a bridge in Hull named after me, which was just like, wow, the new bridge. No one had heard of me in Hull, particularly, although it's better than it used to be. Um, so it, I, I was just felt so, on, but the thing was that three young girls had nominated me that's the thing that was really key to me that my story had inspired them to think that you know and I'd hopefully made a difference to their life I lost to um, a doctor a GP so it was a woman GP uh, but she'd been dead a hundred years so I don't know where that is but uh, yeah but uh, yes and I was up against William Wilberforce as well actually and I came second so I should be quite proud of that shouldn't I (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, maybe in a maybe in hundred years' time there'll be another bridge, um, and, and that'll yeah, be. Yeah. I've got one more question, but I know it's Mark's got his hand up, so I'll bring Mark in um, now. Mark, I would have waited until you finished. I was just saying that. Oh, okay, um, I'll wait. I'll come back in a sec. Okay, okay. Um, it's not like Mark. No, I know it is. It's very like. <laughs> um, so yeah, the final question we ask this of all our speakers at Tumblr School: um, If you have just one minute with you know, the leader of the country, whether that's the UK, England, or Republic of Yorkshire, um, what is the big change, the one big change you'd ask for of them? Um, value mental health and wellbeing and put it first on the foremost of the agenda, particularly young people. I thought long and hard when you asked me this question and I had all sorts. I could have gone on probably for an hour and a, or two hours, but it would be about young people, particularly their mental health and wellbeing, so we can bring a up a resilient society that can manage the bumps in the road as they go. Well, I, 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 I that's admirable. I'd, I'd happily second second that. Um, thanks, Julia. I'll, I'll throw it open to well, Mark initially, and uh, if there's any other questions, I, I think Andy's got a couple uh, as well. Mark? Thanks, Russ. Um, Julia, I thought that was really interesting. Thanks for your time. And so firstly, this is going to sound, I don't normally do this, but I think people owe you a debt of Thanks. People don't say thanks enough to people who push for things. And um, I don't know how many people have said that, which leads me on to my question, I suppose, in some ways. And we talk and it's been something that has been picked up, as Russell said, in other terminal schools. But I've picked it up as well is that people say it's quite a lonely existence pushing for change. And one of the things that strikes me is this. There's a word called compromise that people who push for change aren't very good at doing. And (laughs) I think rightly so. And I'd be really interested in your take on when people, which I'm sure has happened a, a zillion times in your career, have said, you know, just calm down on that, compromise on that. And, you know, there's been those two fingers that I'm sure have been feel like pushing up and saying, no, I'm not going to do it. And I'd be interested in your in your take on that. Thanks. It's, yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. And I used to be quite angry in my 20s and 30s, and I was very direct whole girl. Um, so I never dealt with some of those things very well. And also my face tells um, a big story. I had to learn, uh, which I do a lot now with leaders that I work with around your facial expressions and what you're giving away at meetings. And I think the lesson that I learned was around do not be afraid to stand out in the crowd. You know, do not be afraid. However, there's other ways of getting what you want um as well so maybe at that point so a really good example for me is women in rugby league um we had a tourist in 1996 the first women great britain women toured um australia um and i have been trying for 20 odd years to get these women recognized uh, they've never been capped they've never had their day in the sun you know they beat australia the last team to beat australia and also i've always wanted a women's hall of fame there's men's and the women can't be part of that, but these women have never, these pioneering women have never been recognized. Um, and I have gone at it and at all different, um, different ways. And I finally, um, and it will happen this year where those women will be formally recognized. Uh, there'll be a hall of fame for them. And it just makes me, you know, just well up thinking that there's 50 odd women out there that have never been thanked. And I think thank you is, uh, a really appropriate word for what they've done and they've actually been forgotten because people don't know about them um, so there's always other ways and it's about and I guess William Wilberforce back to him when you look at the history of slavery he waited his time and then it, then he did it and similar with Nelson you know you wait your time and then when it's right you can you can really begin to make those changes I had to learn patience 
Uh, I'm not a very patient person, um, but I've found now that things are really beginning to change and things that, you know, I'm in a position now, which is why I want more women in governance in rugby league, where people listen to me and actually come to me now and say, what do you think about this? Whereas the past when uh, I was, I didn't get that when I was actually in the sport, whereas people are now asking, which is a bit of a scary thing, isn't it? That, you know, what do you think and what should we do differently? Um, so yeah, patience is a big one. And also I used to get very angry and frustrated. I had to have quite a lot of work on the old um, direct speaking um, and honesty of which I've learned to temper. <laughs> Um, part of my uh, little journey but yeah it, it's an interesting one isn't it and it comes around it does come around and you eventually if, if you're passionate about it and I go by my gut now that if it feels right for me and I think that that needs to happen then I'll make it happen in some way however it needs to happen because it's the right thing to do uh, and, and to do it in the right way as well uh, and that's what this Great Britain thing felt to me. It's just the right thing to do. And these women should be recognised. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've just chipped away until eventually she's back again. Right. OK, we'll do it. I'm just going to respond just quickly, just to let you know, one of my um, best nights out was in Yorkshire in Wakey with Andy. Um, we, <laughs> we somehow Not many got, people can say that. Yeah, it was quite strange. <laughs> we, we somehow got caught up in a in a choir training exercise and they were hugely welcoming and Three Welsh, well, Andy's a, uh, we treat him as a Welsh, but three Welsh blokes were allowed to join this choir. None of us could sing, well, Andy may say he can, um, could sing properly. And we sang Boys of Summer, which if, uh, if Andy remembers, it was fantastic. But uh, yeah, so I, have a, 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 I believe Yorkshire people, you know, go the Republic of Yorkshire, I say. But anyway, I'm going. <laughs> Andy, um, I'll bring you in. University Challenge style, Green, Barry Island. Yeah, thank you there. And uh, rest assured, I'm not going to sing. Uh, yes. Julia, absolutely amazing. Truly, truly inspiring. And one day your bridge will come. Um, <laughs> so in our work in Grow Social Capital, we, we one of the skills we teach is about storytelling. And one of the sort of classic plots of storytelling is overcoming the monster. Um, so really, well, I mean, what monsters are there that we need, need to be overcome now? I mean, in terms of realising the world you want to see? Um, from what my experiences, you mean, around... From your experiences and, uh, and going forward, uh, you look around on the horizons out there, what monsters are there that you see that we need to slay? Or you need to be part of a community? Yeah. And I think the monster out there, and I think I've mentioned around mental health and well-being and that belief, because now I've now I'm a convert with neuro-linguistic programming and I've seen the power it's had for me where um, and I'm, I'm not afraid to say I had suicidal thoughts right from being a five and six year old, you know, well, probably younger than that, to be honest. Um, and that hampered me throughout my life, but it was never acknowledged or even known around. And I think. Uh, the biggest thing is around people being able to accept who they are, what they want to, to be and, and, and accept themselves as they are and quieten their heads. So around that thinking and that feeling so that they can they can stand out from the crowd, they can achieve. Um, and I think particularly if you were to look at women's sports, um, I think we're in for a big fall if we don't pick this up now. And I think in men's sport, they're beginning to pick up um, the high suicide rates, the addictions, all those sort oh. of things. But women um, in sport are still part time on the whole, yet they're still playing professionally uh, and they're being lifted right up the agenda. Yet their mental health and well-being is not being taken into account and all this chatter that's in your head. I would bring um, this thinking, feeling model from NLP into primary schools right from five year olds uh, so that they can get their emotional intelligence. They can understand themselves and un being able to say, I'm not all right. Uh, this is going on in my head and making sense of it. Um, and I think if anything, that. That is, to me, the biggest thing from now into the future, not just in sport, but obviously it's a big piece of sport and something that I think if we take the eye off the ball in women's sport, we'll miss it. And um, we need it's something we really need to work at. And also that women's stories, you know, something, a piece of work I'm doing and Russell knows around it is women telling their stories um, and what they've been through and, uh, and where they've come from. And that new generation of women 
uh, being able to see what what the past is because I think they are so hidden, particularly in sport. Um, I've just found actually very excitingly. I haven't told you this, Russ. There was a first women's rugby league game in 1921 in Australia in South Sydney, and 20,000 people attended it. And we've just uncovered wow. that. And that's like, wow, you know, yet still we're uh, fighting for our peace on the page at the minute. But that's just amazing, isn't it? And those pioneering women. The, the, the popularity of, of women's, lots of different sports, team sports of women's <coughs> sports, sort of pre-Second World War, first half of the, of the 20th century, I think is one of the, the, the strangest... Um, I don't know, oversight. I, I don't know what the yeah. word is. Um, yeah, it's probably yeah. not an, just just an oversight. I'm sure there's something else going on. But but you see some of the old footage of of, of the crowds. Um, yeah. That there was huge interest. There were column inches in in the press. Um, I'm doing something next week around around uh, an element of which is is the heritage and history of, of of football in Wales. And Martin Johns, the professor at Swansea University, I know you you, you you you're aware of. He's he's kicking it off, and uh, that's an awful pun, isn't it? And um, but I know that I think uh, I'm pretty sure that women's football is going to figure in that and how popular it was. Mm. So, I, in some respect, as as you know, um, I'm learning very quickly about rugby league. Uh, I'm, I am getting there, but um, that doesn't surprise me. In, yeah. in, in well, we uncovered in 1921. We think there was a game in Featherstone, um, but we think it might be football. Uh, because rugby league governing body in their wisdom at that time thought it wasn't feminine enough for women to play. So we think that all the women that wanted to play rugby league, because women's football was really big in the North, had to play football. We think that that's what was what was behind it. But yeah, the Australians and actually the Aborigines, we found the game and the, uh, the Aborigine women played in the 1950s as well, which will be... Mm -hmm really fascinating but, uh, yeah anyway it's it's interesting and I think I don't know if that answers your question Andy really but I'd you know my passion for um, being able to be who you want to be I think is around being confident in yourself I uh, with my friend that I mentioned that um, is now becoming a business partner we call it team you being able to you know understand yourself better so that you can then do this social capital can work with other people can lead other people but also be yourself and be whoever you want to be is really really key to me and a lot of that is you know around your thinking and your feelings and your behaving and just grasping that and having a high level of emotional intelligence mm -hmm. i've been there's many more chapters to come from you julia <laughs> anybody else Because if not, I'll let you carry on with uh, your, your monster slaying. <laughs> well, give, <laughs> Thank you. Give a, a quick plug to um, sort of any links online, social media, etc. Lee, uh, Lee, Julia. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Sorry. CSI. Yeah. I mean, if you want to sort of look me up on LinkedIn, uh, that's where I mostly hang out at the moment. Uh, so just look for Julia Lee um, at, and at CSI. I'm around there. Do a bit on Facebook and Instagram. I'm not a big Twitter, unfortunately, which I know you all are. I am a bit on Twitter, but it's at CSI2012 and Julia Lee. So I do hang around all of them, uh, but mostly LinkedIn because I'm trying to get, we're going global. So that's where all the business is at the moment. So we well, often see see outdoors as well, isn't it? Lots of pictures. Yeah, out. I do a lot of rambling. So yeah. I've got beautiful hills and beautiful scenery. So all my lives are me walking my dog uh, and talking about what's going on at the time and giving people hints and tips about particularly this last uh, year and a half about how you can manage what's going on in your head uh, so that you can uh, get through the day-to-day -day, day life and living. Yeah. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. I said, I got to know you over the last sort of year or so and um, fascinating stories. Um, there's another, another podcast that we did with Damien Clayton, isn't it? But from the Air Force and again about, again, trying to get that sport a uh, rugby league in the air force the other armed forces as well getting it officially recognized yeah you, you absolutely weren't basically able to have a little bit of time and support maybe some travel expenses to play that 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 game um and that's a really interesting conversation and again there's parallels 
parallels there as well. Oh, Even absolutely, if the, yeah. what might I suppose from the outside feel a bit sort of cosseted and and and, and a bit sort of um, sort of stiff, and and it's you know it's the armed forces and that kind of thing. But again, there's people having to sort of chip away at these uh, at these barriers. Uh, and the, so. yeah, absolutely. And those inequalities, I guess that's what I've always championed is tr- just trying to balance those scales. So mm-hmm. whoever they are, it's something that I'm really passionate about that people have been able to do what they can do um and and not have those barriers and the armed forces is a really good example of that yeah yeah uh so okay um give a plug to uh, previous tumblr school speakers um there they are there's sophie there's alex uh sophie howe alex hillman and peter davis uh, next ones we have uh, luke takuchi from um rha wales housing provider who I've heard Luke talk about how um, housing is not what they provide. It's what they provide. They're very much take it to coming at that from a point of view of building communities and helping people achieve things within their lives, both individually, but also collectively. Um, housing is just a, a way of doing that for them. Um, and Luke has some really interesting takes on this, um, on sort of the, 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 the shift required in the, in, in the housing sector culturally to, to get a bit more, um, get their heads around that a bit more as opposed to just thinking in terms of bricks and mortar and picket fencing and bathrooms and kitchens and all the rest of it. Um, and July, I think we've still got to uh, sort that one out, but that'll happen. That'll happen. Um, quick plug, you can join us on Slack where we talk a bit more about some of these things, either that um, uh, hi- uh, that hyperlink at the bottom or zap that QR code. Um, and uh, we're all on those uh, socials as well. And um, just note that isn't a typo for the Twitter. The character limit means that we don't get quite get the, the AL on it. So, yeah, Julia, thank you. Deal of Um Pleasure to, to spend uh, an hour in your in your company and just keep on doing what you're doing, really, um, because it's, uh, it's 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 great. It's very needed um, and it is changing people's lives. And that's um, that that's that's not a bad thing, obviously. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's been lovely talking to you all.